Episode 13. After the show, please go to tell.fish slash email to sign up for our email newsletter. You will get the inside scoop on new guests and contests before everyone else. We can't wait to welcome you aboard. That's tell.fish slash email. Welcome to the Telltale Fisherman Podcast, where avid anglers share the story of their best fishing day ever to inspire yours. Now it's time for another epic adventure. So here's your host, John Woodson. Okay, welcome to the show. Today's guest is Captain Cam from High Class Hooker Charters. Captain, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just start with you telling us a little bit about yourself and your, your fishing background. Uh, you know, I, I moved to Florida uh, back in 2000. And, uh, you know, I met a local guide here in Sarasota. And, you know, we became pretty good friends. And I started working with him on my days off and my vacations, uh, probably why I got divorced. And, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I just eventually decided to go out on my own and, uh, we've been doing it since then. So that's it. You know, we do inshore, offshore, you know, pretty much anything anybody wants to do. Yeah. So where, where did you move to Florida from? Uh, Massachusetts. Okay. Now, did you do much fishing up there at all or? You know, we grew up uh, in the country and stuff. We did a lot of fishing and hunting, but, you know, nothing like down here. So. Yeah, a lot of people's eyes are open when they when they come to Florida. I'm, I'm starting to see that recurring theme when they uh, see all of the wonderful fish we have to catch here. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, the biggest thing I caught up there was like two pounds. So, you know, we use that for bait some days. So, you know, <laughs> right. it was quite an eye-opening experience when I moved down here. Right, absolutely. So... When you uh, when you started and went out on your own, were you were you doing offshore or inshore or what what kind of fishing? Mostly inshore. You know, okay. I, I worked for my buddy. You know, uh, offshore for a while, and then uh, you know I went inshore just because the boat was cheaper. Yeah. And um, you know, fished inshore for years, and then made the move offshore. And you know, now I spend my days you know anywhere in between. So it just depends on what people want. So so you have a couple of boats and get to do all different things, huh? Yeah, you know, it kind of mixes it up a little bit, so I well, don't get quite as bored. Well, right, <laughs> and and I guess as as the seasons go, too, it's nice to have uh, different options. Yeah, you know, I do a lot of tarpon fishing along the beach and stuff still in the in the summer and the spring, so that's nice. It gives me a break from offshore, and, uh, you know, I still like hunting reds and, you know, snook along the backcountry, so... Yeah, it's nice to break up the monotony. Right. Yeah, you mentioned the the tarpon fishing. Um, so so you're you're based out of Venice, uh, Florida, correct? Correct. Yeah. So yep. talk talk to people a little bit about the area and the Florida Gulf Coast there, and and how that whole tarpon scene works, because I, I don't know that a you lot know, of people lo- understand how they migrate and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're located about halfway between, you know, Boca Grande, which is, you know, considered like the tarpon capital of the world, Mm -hmm. and Tampa Bay. And the tarpon kind of move back up and down the beaches between, you know, Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor. So we catch them along the beach, you know, as they migrate up and down. So we're fishing anywhere from like, you know, two feet of water to, you know, 20 feet of water, waiting for the big pods to come through. It's all sight fishing. And uh, And it's right off the beach, right? That's how we do it. Right off the beach. Yep. Yeah. Now, so I, I actually, I want your area there. We normally go to uh, Longboat Key for our vacation, just a little north of where you are. And yep. uh, I love snook fishing off the beach there, and have done a little bit of tarpon fishing myself. Um, what I've always done and seen some of the private guys, you know, you know, not the charter captains do, is they'll go out and anchor and wait for those pods to come through. And then, but I see, you know, all the charter captains with their boats and they're out sight fishing. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? You know, how you approach them when you're out fishing? Yeah, you know, when we leave the, you know, the inlet in the morning, I like to leave early. Um, a lot of guys leave, you know, around 6, 6.30 at first light. We try and be on the beach waiting as first light pops up. A lot of mornings we're hooked up you know, just as the sun breaks or even before. But, um, you know, mostly what we do is just, you know, slowly move down the beach. Um, a lot of times we're running right up on the beach, just at idle, you know, looking west and uh, just waiting for pods to pop up. And, you know, then we maneuver on them, trying to figure out which way they're going, how fast they're going, and, and make our shots that way. So, 
you know, but there's any day where I could leave the, you know, the Venice Inlet and end up in Boca Grande or end up, you know, off of Anna Maria. You know, some days you just got to run to find them. Oh, wow. You run so, that far, huh? You know, my job's to put people on fish. So, you know, <laughs> a lot of guys will sit and wait or they'll work a specific area, but I just keep going until I find fish. You yeah. Know, I'm not afraid to burn up some gas. Yeah. They're there somewhere, so, right? They got to be somewhere in there, you know, and they could be, you know, north, they could be south, or, you know, sometimes you sit there all morning and all of a sudden they'll blow up at the, you know, around 11 o'clock noon, and you never know. You just got to put the time in. And, and when you're when you're sight casting from them, so you're, you're up on a tower, right, driving the boat from a tower? No. Oh, no? No, I actually uh, I got a small flash boat, uh, technical skiff that they use for bonefish in the Keys. Okay. So, oh, oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's how we do it. We, we run that way. Okay, and then you're just trying to get in front of them and, and cast a bait out to them, I guess. Yeah, we try and maneuver on them and see which way they're kind of moving, you know, because even a laid-out pod is still kind of moving a little bit. We want to get in front of them right. so our bait gets down. Right, and are you using live baits or, or dead baits? or? Uh, mostly live bait, but we do use uh, artificials when customers uh, request bait. Oh, like fly, if they want to use flies or something like that? Yeah, some guys just like artificials, you know, tarpon, fly, you know, artificial. It really just depends on what the customer wants. Right. So. Right. Well, you you certainly have some epic tarpon fish pictures on your website. There, I would see some some mighty big ones. So, what are what are some of the bigger ones you good. get? Yeah. What are some of the biggest ones you you've gotten? Uh, I think the biggest uh, on a charter we've ever landed, you know, length and girth, put it around two or three. Wow. So. And and how long yeah, of a fight? That was a big one. Yeah. How long of a fight is that? Uh, two and a half, three hours. <laughs> I guess yeah. every, everybody's worn out by the end of that. You know, I'm tired just watching them. Oh, my goodness, so. yeah. <laughs> but, you yeah. know, we, every year we get a couple in the 180, 190 range, so. Awesome. But the average fish is usually like around 110, 120, something there. Excellent. Well, um, yeah, I'd encourage everybody to uh, take a look at your website to see some awesome uh, tarpon pictures. And uh, we'll have that link posted and everything with the, with the show notes so people can check that out. And, uh, Definitely. So, yeah, well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, uh, you're going to share an epic offshore story with us. So everybody stay tuned. If you ever go fishing by yourself, it adds a little bit extra challenge to get the boat on and off the trailer. A boat launch cord makes launching much easier, so you can get on the water quicker and without damaging your boat. Go to tell.fish slash gear in your web browser and check out the boat launch cord that we like the best. But remember, it works a lot better if you attach it to your trailer before you back the boat in the water. Okay, we are back with uh, Captain Cam, and uh, I am looking forward to hearing about uh, some of your offshore exploits. Uh, you have a particular day in, day in <laughs> mind where uh, y- it was just off the chain? You know, not really. I mean, you know, we try and hit out of the park mm-hmm. every day, so, you know, I don't, you know, an epic is, you know, it's, it's personal. Like, we, we try and make it epic for the customer. Right. You know, what might be epic to me, to somebody else, is nothing or what I might consider trivial to a customer is amazing, you know, so sometimes it's their most fish ever or their biggest fish and stuff like that. So, you know, we talk to every customer and we just try and, you know, hit it out of the park. Right. As best we can. So, yeah, but, I mean, you always see like cool things. You know, we hooked a whale shark by accident last year. We didn't know what it was for like, you know, three and a half hours. I thought it was a big <laughs> nurse shark or something. Oh my God. So it just goodness. came up by the boat and scared the crap out of us. And, uh, Wow. You know, just cool things. You see big cobia, you know, riding on the back of sharks or something, or you see just cool stuff. Every, everybody likes something different. Right, right. Well, what's your personal uh, favorite thing to to uh, fish for offshore? Um, you know, I, I got to say, I love hogfish. You know, a lot of guys have a hard time getting them on hook and line, but for some reason I seem to have figured it out. And, you know, they're hard, to, they're hard fighting. They're, you know, a, a trick to get to them, and they just... It tastes great, so I love hogfish. Yeah, I've I've never caught one. So have you ever had a day where I mean you just got on the hogfish and were catching them? Oh yeah, you know it actually happened this year. Uh, we were just uh, we pulled into a couple ledges uh, in an area I had up north off of CSC Key, and uh, you know we were looking for mangrove snappers and stuff on the ledge, and uh, we dropped down, and you know right off the bat was a big hog, big male, and then uh, you know next drop was a hogfish, and I think we ended up with something like. 
12 or 13 by the end of the day, if I remember correctly. Oh, my goodness. So, so I mean, we just we, we hit the mother load. It was great. Oh, heck, yeah. I mean, I've, I've still yet to catch my uh, first one from, from offshore fishing. I mean, I've caught a lot of things. But, yeah, I've heard they're really hard to get um, on hook and line. I mean, what... Yeah. Not not to give away your trade secrets or anything, but uh, is right, is right. there some is there some trick to getting them on hook and line? I mean, do you have to chum you them? No, or... it's super light tackle. No, okay. it's a super light tackle. And uh, usually with hogfish, you're going to get them right off the bat, or you're going to get them after everything else stops biting. You know, they're real shy. Uh, they're there the whole time, but, you know, when the snappers are going or the grouper are going or, you know, grunts or whatever else, they just won't come in. They'll kind of stay back. And then once the bike kind of dies off a little bit, you just sit and wait and, uh, you know, they will come in. So, but usually, you know, it's, you know, it's October through like April is like peak season for them. Okay. Is it a little bit different as you go farther south? You know, I've really never fished farther than south than Boca Grand Pass, you okay. know, professionally and stuff. So, right. or targeted hogfish, you know, anywhere else. So, but like October through like, you know, like late April, first of May is like the best. So. Wow, 12, 12 hogfish in one day. That's that's a pretty epic adventure right there. Um, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, do you ever have clients that specifically want to target hogfish? I do. You know, now that we've gotten a reputation for, you know, being able to target them on hook and line, mm-hmm. um, you know, people actually book us just to get that. I mean, I got one guy. Coming down next year, he's already booked a couple dates just because he wants a big hogfish so he can get a mount made and you know oh, wow. stuff like that. Wow! And so you, I, I'm I'm sure you have some spots you like better than others for for hogs. You mentioned a ledge there. I guess you were fishing. Is is that? Yeah, you know better? any kind of structure or ledge will hold them. Okay, so so all the same places that grouper and snapper will hang out. Yeah, I mean they're right there with them the whole time. You know, I got some buddies that dive and you know they tell you where they are. And, but they're uh, they're in the same spots, same habitat. Yeah, that's that, that's something that I would like to uh, to see one of these days come over the come over the gunnel. And and they're supposed to be fantastic eating, right? Oh, phenomenal! Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm not a big fish person, but I'll eat them. So. <laughs> that that one's on the list, huh? Yeah, they're definitely up there. That and Kobe, I like those two are good. Everything else, I kind of pass on. But. Yeah. So how f- how far do you typically go out on your on your charters? Because the Gulf is, is pretty shallow compared to the uh, the other coast of Florida, where where I fish most often. Yeah, you know, I on an average day, I like to stay within like 45, 50 feet of water. So anywhere from like eight to nine miles is like a a good distance for me. We don't have to run too far. Okay, so you, you've got a little deeper water maybe there than they do further up north on the Gulf, I guess? In some spots, they're a little shallower, but, you know, like eight and a half, eight to nine miles, we're looking at like 45, 50 feet. You know, sometimes a couple spots would be like 55 feet, but that's that's a good range right there for everything we're trying to target. Right, right. And uh, now, do you get any, you ever get any pelagics in at that depth, or you got to go farther out for that kind of stuff? Uh, I've hooked two sailfish in the past year. We haven't landed one yet, but we did hook two. Um, <laughs> they're good I was like sitting that. there one day. They are. And, yeah. uh, you know, of course, they hit when you're not expecting them. Oh, of course, them. yeah. Tons of kingfish. I mean, we can do a lot of kings. Um, Bonita, blackfin. You know, I have seen a small school, like, chicken dolphin go by. But, mm-hmm. of course, we weren't ready. But, yeah. You know, stuff like that. Awesome. Well, they, is there... Uh, you know, of all the trips and things you've seen out there, I mean, you mentioned the whale shark. Is there anything else that just kind of stands out in your mind? Like, yeah, you know, this is just incredible. I mean, you know, it, you just take it all in. You know, I've, I've seen so many things out there. It's hard to you know put your finger on one. You know, I, right? We've seen turtles mating. We got a video of that on one of the websites. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen you know fifty, sixty dolphins up by the boat. Everybody loves that. And, oh you yeah. Know, just, the Gulf is such a rich and diverse you know, ecosystem. There's just so much stuff out there, which is cool to watch. It is. Well, it, well. so just for folks listening, if they wanted to uh, come down and, and fish with you, what times of year are best for which? You know, inshore, the tarpon, and then the, the offshore. What do you recommend? <laughs> yeah. If you're looking for tarpon, you know, May and June are, are your peak months. Uh, that's when they're here thick. Um, the big schools, when they start to break up after that. But, uh, as far as inshore and offshore, you know, we run 365 days a year, so there's always something around. 
Right. You know? And do you? And I guess sometimes you you may call an audible if uh, it's rough offshore and do an inshore instead, that kind of thing. Yeah, we try and get people as you know on the water as much as possible. You know, if we're right. not running, we're not making money. So we if if they're flexible, we can. If we got a day open, we'll we'll try and switch it around. But if we can't, we'll try and run them inshore. Mm-hmm. You know, just to get them on the water and do something. Well, it's it's certainly great to have uh, such a wonderful location like you do that you have that option. <laughs> oh yeah, you know the Gulf Coast is you know phenomenal. We got great inshore fishing, and you know we have great bottom fishing and stuff in the Gulf, so we can go either way. Awesome. Well, m- maybe on my uh, next uh, golf trip, I might venture just a little bit farther south and uh, come see you there. It uh, sounds sounds like you've got it going on. Yeah, come on down, man. We'll get you out. All right. That would be awesome. Well, Captain Cam, I really appreciate you uh, coming on and uh, and telling us about the hogfish and all the other wonderful things you've seen out there. Um, it makes me want to go grab a pole and go fishing. There you go, man. Get out there and get at them. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. No problem, man. Do you have an epic fishing story to tell? We want to hear it. Go to tell.fish slash guest in your browser and sign up to become a fishing legend today. This has been the Telltale Fisherman Podcast. Thanks for sharing another great tale with us. Be sure to check out the show notes page for more info on today's show and the gear we talked about. Keep those lines tight and we'll catch you next time right here on the Telltale Fisherman Podcast.